Amen. All right, so we're going to be in 1 Samuel 18. <clears throat> Excuse me, 1 Samuel 18 tonight. So if you want to turn there with me, 1 Samuel 18. Uh, and we're going to look at friendships. And it's interesting tonight how friendships come to be. Uh, sometimes friendships, you know, you, you start in school uh, and you just become friends because you, you know, you have classes together and you're together every day for, you know, seven and eight hours a day. So therefore, you know, you, you almost can't help it but to be friends. How many of y'all have friends that you grew up with in school that you're still friends with today? Any of y'all have some of those friends? I've got some of those today. Uh, you know, we may not talk as much as we used to, but anytime I would need them, probably same as you. Anytime I need them, I could call them, and I know that they would be there and the same with me. So those are, those are good friends. But then there's sometimes, it's kind of what we're going to talk about tonight, that, that some friends come about that is, it's almost a divine meeting, that you didn't plan on meeting each other, you didn't plan on seeing each other. You know, one of my greatest friends, and uh, he goes to Oakdale, him and his family do, and, you know, he and I met, and we met in the most odd way. You know, his family, his mother-in-law, and... Um, uh, it was his, yeah, his mother-in-law and father-in-law, they were uh, attending our church there at Cherokee Springs and um, I just enjoyed being there. And we were having, I think it was a Christmas party at our house one night for our Sunday school class. And she texted me and she said, hey, can I bring my son or my daughter, my son-in-law and my daughter to the party? And I was like, well, sure. And he came in and as soon as he walked in the door, he was a police officer at the time and he walked in and man, he had his, his gun and his uniform and, and I'm, I ain't gonna lie to you, as soon as he walked in the door I didn't like him as soon as he walked in the door I didn't like him right off the bat just the way he was looking and acting you know it was just one of those just arrogant looking people you know and so I saw him and I just didn't like him and and so we you know we we ended up talking a little bit that night and I'm gonna tell you and that was I don't even know how I mean that was probably 2012 maybe 2013 something like that 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 we met and you know he is he I would say he's probably one of my best friends in the world then I even talked to him just a few minutes ago that you know we fight like dogs but, you know, we are we are best friends to the end, and we've always been there for one another. But it was one of those things that I, I never even thought about seeing him or meeting him. But, you know, it's just those divine things that you that you just find somebody in life that you can you can be real with, you can be honest with. I think I've shared it with you before about friendships. You know, you can have, you know, some people have a thousand or two thousand friends on social media and Facebook and Instagram and all that other stuff. But those aren't real friends. Those are just acquaintances. Those are people that you know. Those are people, maybe you might even see them out in public and have no idea who they really are. But when you get a true friend, you know, they, there might be four or five in a whole lifetime of true friends in your life. People that you can count on, call no matter what. You can be honest with them, open with them, no judging. You know, they just love you. They just support you. You see, that was Jonathan and David. It was a divine meeting for Jonathan and David. So we're going we're gonna to be in 1 Samuel 18, verses 1 through 7. So if you have your Bible, would you stand with me tonight as we honor the reading of God's Word? 1 Samuel 18, verses 1 through 7. We're talking about that type of just amazing friendship between these two young men. It says in verse 1 of 1 Samuel 18, And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him go, uh, no more home to his father's house. And then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. And David went out, whether so Saul sent him, and behaved himself wisely. And Saul sent him over and set him over men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And it came to pass as they came when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets with joy and with instruments of music and 
And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Let's pray tonight. Father, we thank you, Lord, tonight for how we can worship together, Father, as, as friends, as family. And God, I pray that we would have great attitudes, Lord, towards those that we see, maybe those that we're not friends with yet, but just those divine appointments that we can reach out and show people love. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Y'all can be seated tonight. So we're talking about friendships. Now, you know, it, it would be easy to look at chapter 18 and say, well, it's obvious how... Jonathan was so drawn close to David. Maybe he was scared of him. Maybe it was just fear was the reason that he became so close to him. You know, if there's somebody that you have a, a true fear of, it's not a good idea to oppose them, right? It's not a good idea to, to make enemies with them. So, so you draw them close. You're friends with them. You're nice to them, whatever the case is. But you see, in this situation, it wasn't that, it wasn't that Jonathan had a fear of David. It wasn't that he was even to the point of he was mesmerized by the power of David, by the strength of David. You know, it was the fact that Saul, or excuse me, that Jonathan and David both had an amazing love for God. It was that they both grew up as Israelites. They both were, uh, were servants of the great high God. It was an amazing divine friendship that came. At the the end of verse, or excuse me, at the end of chapter 17, in verse 58, the Bible says that this was the, one of the, the first times that uh, David and Saul had a conversation after the, uh, after the killing of Goliath that we talked about this morning. In verse 58, it said, And Saul said to him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. So this was the moment that, that Saul knew who he was. And that's where we started at tonight. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit. So what's that mean, the soul of Jonathan was knit? This is the same term, the same words that was used in the Old Testament when, uh, when the Bible referred to Jacob's love for Benjamin. Now, if you remember Jacob and, and Benjamin, uh, Jacob being the father of Benjamin, uh, being the father of Joseph, man, they were, uh, they were close, they were tight because it was, that was, um, Benjamin's mother was the one that Jacob loved the most. He cared about the most. He was one of the youngest of of the sons. So he loved him dearly. It was a relationship between a father and a son. It was knit. The Hebrew word for knit was bound up. In other words, inseparable. They were close. You see, we have family like that, but man, when you have a friend that's just bound up to you, that's close to you. It means so much. It means so much to your heart that you can have someone like that in your life. It says, The soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. You know, if you read where Jesus was asked in the New Testament, he, asked, he was asked, What are the greatest commandments? You know what I'm talking about? And so when Jesus was asked that, he said, one is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But what was the second one? Love your neighbor as yourself. That was the second commandment. You see, that is, uh, that is a commandment of God, to love your neighbor as yourself. But I believe that we, if we're all honest tonight, we fail to do that. We fail to love our neighbor as ourselves. We may love our neighbors. We may care about our neighbors. We may, we may borrow stuff from our neighbors. Man, I call Bobby all the time. He's one of the closest ones I got. Man, I call him all the time for stuff. He probably gets tired of it. But, you know, he's, he's close, so he lets me borrow stuff all the time. And other folks in the church, man, they just let me, let me use stuff. You think I'm just don't have anything at my house. I promise there is some things there, but maybe not what you have, right? But you see, you can let people borrow stuff, but still not have a love for one another. Still not have that desire to be bound up, to be close. You see, I think when you have a friend that you pray for day in and day out, 
that you check on day in and day out, that you worship the Lord with day in and day out. I believe there's a love there. I believe there's a relationship that's there. And that's the type of relationship that Jonathan and David had. And it wasn't a relationship that, that grew out of nothing or that grew out of this. It was an instant relationship. It was an instant love. Church, that's the type of love that Jesus has for us. It's an instant love. You know, as the Bible says that he loved us while we were yet sinners, it was an instant love before, even Jeremiah says, uh, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. So that means it was an instant love that Jesus had for us. You see, there may be people in your life where you say, Michael, I just, I just can't be friends with them. Well, why? Why can you not be friends with them? Is it because you have disagreements? Well, I... I, I love my wife with all my heart, but we don't agree with everything. You don't have to always agree with everybody. But the Bible says that you need to love them as yourself. You see, Saul, or excuse me, Jonathan and David, man, they loved one another as their own soul. They, they had a connection with one another. Now, it's good that they loved one another because if you read in the next verse... It would have been a terrible situation if they didn't love one another. You say, well, why? Well, look in verse 2. And Saul took him that day and would not let him go no more home to his father's house. They were instantly roommates. So they better love each other, right? They better get along or it's going to be a difficult life for both of them. But this was, this was an amazing thing. It was an amazing, it was, it was a sleepover that never ended for, for Jonathan and David. The Bible says in verse 3 that Jonathan and David made a covenant. Well, what kind of covenant would that be? Well, you think about the covenants that, that God made with people throughout the Old Testament. You think about, think about uh, the, the covenant that he made with Noah. He said, I'm, I'm going to use the rainbow and I'm never going to flood the earth again. You think about the covenant that he made with Moses about being there for his people, being there for the family or for the tribe of Israel. You think about the, the covenant that he made with Abraham about bringing him to a promised land. You see, all of these covenants, it wasn't just words, but it was a promise. It was saying, I will never leave you. I am always here. You see, the covenant that we make with our friends here on earth, the covenant that we make with other people while we're here on this side of eternity, they should be promises. They should be promises that we say that regardless what happens in life, regardless what Satan throws at us, we will not separate. We will not cause the cause. We will not allow the smallest things in our life, the most uh, the most craziest disagreements that we have. Those things will not split our friendship. Because if you don't believe it or not, it's not that Satan is going to cause a split in friendships, but he uses what what at one time was a friendship, and it won't just split friendships, but it will split families. It will split sons and fathers. It will split mothers and daughters. It will split churches straight down the middle because we allow Satan's little small plans or small thoughts to get in our head. And the next thing you know, those covenants means, those covenants, they don't mean anything anymore. Those promises that we've made to one another to always be friends, they don't mean anything anymore. Man, if we keep our eyes on Christ, we are brothers and sisters. If we're believers, we are brothers and sisters to the Most High God. He said, And Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. So before we read verse 4, let's go back to the book of Acts. I want to talk about how, how the first church did. If you remember, we read not too long ago how the, how the first church, uh, how they handled themselves in the very beginning. The Bible says that they, that they took all of their possessions and they sold all their possessions so that they could minister to whoever had a need. They wanted to reach out to anybody and everybody that had a need. They were willing to take their, literally take the clothes off their backs and hand them to somebody else. You see, that's, I believe that's the love that God teaches 
throughout the Bible, that we ought to love people that much to help them. You know, you read about the Good Samaritan. Everything they did was, everything the Good Samaritan did was one-sided. They weren't looking for anything in return, but just ministering. Listen to what Jonathan did for David. Verse 4. It says, and Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him. Now, now, why would Jonathan go through all this? Well, they were two totally different people. If you remember when we talked not too long ago about, um, about God sending Samuel to David, where was David at when he was first called? He was in the field, wasn't he? He was tending sheep. His own father had forgotten about him. He said, oh, yeah, I got one out in the field that's tending sheep. Let me go grab him. You see, shepherds were not allowed in the temples because they were nasty. They stunk because they lived with their sheep. So they were never clean enough to walk into the temple. You see, that was David. He was a shepherd. We know that. The Scripture says David was a shepherd. So he was not... He was not dressed, if you want to call it that. He, he, didn't, he didn't dress himself to where he was seen as a palace resident, if you want to call it that. See, Jonathan and David, they, they were raised as two totally different people. They had different lifestyles. They were dressed differently. They looked differently. I'm sure Prince Jonathan... The son of the king, I'm sure he was decked out in the finest robes, in the nicest sandals, the most expensive rings on his hands. But yet him and David, David being a peasant shepherd out in the field, they instantly connected. What if the church did what Jonathan did? What if we reached out to those that didn't look like us. Those that didn't dress like us. People that were raised totally different than we are. But yet we gave what we could to them. You see, it wasn't too long ago that, um, that there was someone that I met and, uh, man, we had a, had a great relationship right off the bat. And, man, we, uh, you know, our Sunday school class, you know, we, we got things for them and, and took it to them. And, you know, it wasn't, you know, a month or so later that, that I stopped getting phone calls from them and that was it. And you see, as Christians, we may look at situations like that and say, I'm not wasting my time. I'm not, I'm not wasting my my. my resources to somebody that's going to be like that. But if we're honest with each other, that's how we have been to Christ at some point in our life. We come to him in time of need and we say, God, I need this and I need that and I need this. But then when it's time for us to have that relationship with him, we're gone. We're not in church. We're not praying. We're not reading. We're, we're, we're the furthest thing from God. So for us to look down on somebody that would do that to us, well, that's the same thing that we've done to God time and time again throughout our relationship with Him. You see, for us to say, well, I, they're, they're going to do this or they're going to... That's, that's irrelevant. That's not up to you. That's not up to me. See, Jonathan could have looked at David and said, you're not my kind of person, so I'm not going to help you. But that's not the love that God has given us in our life. It says in verse 4 that Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him, and he gave it to David. You see, when you give something to somebody, you don't expect anything in return. That is a one-sided thing. You give it to him. He gave him his garments. He gave him his robe. He gave him his sword, even to his bow. He gave him his girdle. Man, he gave him everything, everything that he had. Because you see, Jonathan could go back to his wardrobe. He could go back to his servants and he can put a new, he, I'm sure, could have put a new wardrobe on. He could have put different clothes on just like the clothes that he had. Because he had more. You see, we have that love that we have that God has given us. Man, we can empty ourselves to other people. Because the Bible says that God is rich in mercy and grace and love. We can, we can give everything we have, everything we have to somebody in our hearts. 
You know, I mean, you may not be able to do it financially. You may not be able to do it with stuff. But it's like when Peter and John was walking into the temple where the gate beautiful, he looked at the person and he says, I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have I will give you. And he said, get up and walk in the name of Jesus Christ. He said he gave what he had, and that was Jesus. See, tonight we can give our friends, we can give people we don't even know all of Jesus that we have. He gave it all. He gave him his bow, he gave him his girdle. And the Bible says in verse 5 that David went out, whether so Saul sent him. He behaved himself wisely. Jonathan had one of the purest hearts of the Old Testament. You know, when, when people look at David and they look at Saul, man, they bypass, they bypass Jonathan. But he had one of the purest hearts of the Old Testament. Do you know how quickly Jonathan could have been jealous of David? How quickly he could have been, he could have been angry at how, how instantly Saul elevated David and his armies. How quickly he brought him over all of the men of war. But he was free of jealousy, but he was full of love and loyalty. Jonathan was. All the way to the very end, dying, he was full of love and loyalty. You see, that's an example that we can follow tonight. Being empty of jealousy but full of love and loyalty to Christ. Now, how many decisions have we made in our life that was 100% motivated by jealousy? Absolutely motivated by anger. I say we're all guilty of doing that at some point in our life. See, Jonathan was empty of jealousy. Was he perfect? No. But you can tell he was full of love and loyalty. See, the Bible says that Saul set him over the men of war, that he was accepted in the sight of all people. You remember what we were talking about this morning? Three sets of people ridiculed David. They put him down. They said, man, go home. Go away. But because of how much David trusted God, now all of a sudden he's accepted across the board. Because of his obedience to God. Because of his love for God. Was he strong? Probably not that strong. I mean, he was strong, but I mean, to the point of fighting, man, that was God that did that. That was God that won that war, that won that battle for Goliath. It says he was accepted in the sight of all people and also in the sight of Saul's servant. And it came to pass as, as when David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine that women came out of all the cities singing and dancing. To meet King Saul with tabrets with joy, with instruments of music. Man, it was a festival. Things were going great for David. He had a new best friend. He was living in the palace. He was over men of war, being even a teenager. He was over men of war. He was, he was a, a sergeant, if you want to call, in, the, in, the, in Saul's military. But here's what I want to talk about tonight. Just as we saw this morning, just as we've seen over the past, man, several weeks as God is continuing to move within the church, it was one comment, it was one comment by just some random people, right? By just some random people that caused hatred to go into Saul's heart just like that. And it changed everything. It changed everything for David. It says in verse 7, And the woman answered one another as they played, and said, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. That was the end of the honeymoon, so to speak. That was it. It went from Saul loving David as a, as a son, as, a, as one of his leaders... To the very next verse, it says, And Saul was very wroth, and he was displeased. Did David do anything differently? No, he didn't. He didn't do anything differently. He done, if anything, he done what Saul told him to do. But because of somebody not even in the picture, but just some ladies worshiping God and having almost a parade and being thankful for what their, what their leaders are doing to keep them safe. It caused Saul to hate David. Just that quick. 
Even to the point, if you keep reading through 1 Samuel chapter 18, that, that Saul tried to kill David multiple times. You know, you would think that would cause Jonathan to say, hey, you know, <laughs> we're close, but this covenant's got to end. I'm not risking my life for you. But he was so devout to David. He was so committed to the covenant that he made to David that regardless if it caused his life to be in danger, he loved David that much. He was bound to David. He was knit to David. Church, what if we were bound that close to one another? What if we were knit that close to each other? That regardless what happens, regardless what somebody else outside of the church may say, somebody outside of your family may say, say it doesn't matter because I love them that much. I'm not going to care what other people say because I'm going to promise you today, somebody always has something to say, right? Somebody always has something to say. But God is moving. God is doing great things. There's friendships that we need to have. David, the Bible says that David was playing with his hand. In verse 10, he was playing the harp. And Saul had a javelin in his hand. And he says, for I said in verse 11, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And man, God got him out of there just like that. Three times that we know of just in through verse 19. Saul tried to kill David over and over again. You see, I'm going to read this quickly and then we'll, we'll close out tonight. If you go to verse 20, listen to the protection, or excuse me, go to chapter 20. Listen to the protection that Jonathan gave David. You know, the Spirit of God has been protecting David. Even in chapters 19 and 20, David is on the run. His even wife is, uh, his wife has even uh, basically turned her back on David. He was worshiping and praising God, and she looked out the window, and she saw him worshiping the Lord and dancing with all of his might, and she, man, she was mad. She was upset. And it caused, God caused his wife to be barren because of, the, because of what she saw, because of her attitude. But David was on the run. In chapter 20, verse 4, it says, And then said Jonathan unto David, Whatsoever thy soul desireth, I will even do it for thee. And David said to Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow in the new moon... I should not fail to sit with the, with the king at meat, but let, but let me go that I may hide thyself in the field until the third day. If thy father uh, at all miss me, then say David earnestly asked, leave of me that he might run to Bethlehem his city. For there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. Go down to verse 9. It says, And Jonathan said, Far be it from thee. For if I know certainly that evil were determined by my father to come upon me, then would I not tell it to thee? And David said to Jonathan, Who shall tell me, or what serve thy father knows so roughly? Answer thee roughly. And Jonathan said unto David, Come, let us go out into thy field. And they both went out to the field. Jonathan said unto David, O Lord God of Israel, when, when I have sounded my father about tomorrow any time or on the third day, and behold, there would be good toward David, then I will send out not unto thee and show thee. You see, Jonathan had a protection for David. He loved him. He cared about him. You see, tonight we need to have a protection, not just a, uh, not just, I guess you'd say a worldly friendship, Man, we need to have that covenant, not with just one another inside our church, but that covenant to those around us, to those in our community. You know, I read not too long ago that about the um, even people that are invited to the church. And I read it was like 80 something percent of people that come inside the church to visit and and become saved. And, and God moves in their life and they devote their heart and life to the Lord. You know, over 80 percent of the people that do that within the church is not invited by the pastor. 
They're not invited by social media. They're not invited by ads or billboards or any of those things. You know who they're invited by? You. They're invited by the members of the church. Because you have made a covenant to the church and to God and to those people within the church that you love them and you care about them and this is a family. And you make those, you make those connections to all those that you love. You see, it's all about the kingdom. It's all about serving God and living for the Lord. So I want to I have a, a time of prayer tonight. Miss Glenda, if you will come and play for us tonight, if you would. I want you to think about those people in your life that maybe for whatever reason you have stopped being friends with. Maybe you've stopped associating with, and it's because of the most silliest thing you can think about. I want you to pray about that situation, and I want you to pray that God would give you the words to, to resolve that situation. I want you to pray about those people maybe you work with, maybe that's even in your family, that you have disassociated yourself with because you don't agree with what they're doing. But there's such a, uh, such a window for you to minister to them, to love them, to bring them back to be a part of your family but you just choose not to. And sometimes we as Christians, we use the phrase, well, I just can't, and God knows my heart. You see tonight, God does know your heart, and that's, that's, that's all there is to it. It's not that you can, it's that we choose not to. And we all have these people in our life. And as Christians, those are situations that we can help. Those are people that we can lead to the Lord if we choose to, if we choose to. So if you would stand with me tonight, I want to pray for you, and I want to give you an opportunity to come down. If you would go and stand tonight.